Good evening and welcome to Constructing Knowledge, the program that changes how we know the world. I'm your host, Mark Strathy, and tonight we have as our guest the artist Gary Panter. Gary is among a handful of legends in the world of underground comics, that is to distinguish the, these from comics involving superheroes. Underground comics are generally more psychological and surreal. Born in Oklahoma, Panter is known for his aggressive punk style from the late 70s and early 80s. He was an early contributor to Art Spiegelman's Raw magazine, and he has done numerous illustrations for album art such as Frank Zappa's Mothers of Invention and The Screamers. He developed a continuing saga of Jimbo in the late 70s, a disaffected and confused youth who slogged his way through Dal Tokyo, a surreal and futuristic place that belies Panter's affection for Philip K. Dick. Recently, Pander has Jimbo following Virgil through Dante's Divine Comedy in a series of lavish graphic novels. Jimbo is normally perplexed by the world he inhabits, which brings to mind Alice's dilemma in Wonderland. Gary was instrumental in the design of Pee-wee's Playhouse in the 1980s. He has three Emmy Awards for his efforts with Pee-wee. In 1993, The New Yorker sent Pander to Waco, Texas to do some reportage illustrations and stories about the siege of the Branch Davidian cult. That year, he also did a feature for The New Yorker called Summer in the City. Gary is currently having an exhibition of his paintings from the 1980s to the present, a retrospective at Frederick's Freezer in Chelsea. And I, I wanted to talk about that a little bit because um, you've always had a foot in both worlds. Like, you've always done commercial work or illustration, but you've also done work for galleries and, you know, paintings. I mean, is and your show in Chelsea is has a little bit of both, or is it? Well, it's all personal work. It's all personal work. Right. And yeah. then that's how I define the difference. People often ask me about commercial art versus fine art. Mm -hmm. And it's really personal work versus commissioned work in some ways. Uh -huh. um, and I really set out to be a painter. That's what I, my first passion was uh, after dinosaurs. Right, right. Was, uh, <laughs> modern art. And uh, so since I was a kid, I've been painting <clears throat> and uh, you studied painting in uh, I, I, right I have a degree in painting from yeah. East Texas State University uh -huh. and uh, but uh, in the 60s I got interested in comics through hippie comics and uh, so I became known for that mm -hmm. under you mean uh, <clears throat> define hippie comics oh zap comics zap was a comics. good example of R. Crumb and yeah. the guys in the late 60s early 70s <clears throat> And, uh, <clears throat> but you were, when you were in school, were, was that, that was around at that time, you know, that was in the air. It was hippie days yeah. when I went to school. It was 1969 when I went to college. Mm -hmm. And so it was uh, a little late to be in, you know, the main thrust of hippies, but mm -hmm. the 60s kind of went on to about 1976 in some ways. You know. Oh, yeah, definitely. That was the last time I saw anyone flash the peace sign was in 76. Because, you know, you would be the generation after our crumb. I mean, our crumb is probably 15 or 10 or 15 years. Maybe like eight years, but still okay. it's made a yeah. big difference. Uh, a few yeah. years made a big difference. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so was, it, was your Bible Belt background instrumental in um, making you who you are? Or yeah. That kind of irreverent, uh, I mean, there's nothing less Bible Belt than Zap comic books, you know, I guess. That's true, but they, they probably couldn't exist without uh, fundamentalist Christianity. Yeah. Now, I was raised in Texas among very serious, righteous people, mm -hmm. but people who thought everyone else was going to hell. Right. But them. Right. And like a lot of religions, so it wasn't really a very Christianly Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, and it burned me out. I was a I was a missionary to Belfast, Northern Ireland, in 1969, and that was kind of the end. After I went to college, then were you in high school then? Or? I was it was when I was a senior in high school. Uh -huh. the, the year after I graduated, I went to Belfast. And, Is that right? Yeah. But there was a lot of art happening in Belfast, so I could kind of somehow sneak away, or people helped me sneak away, or uh, mm -hmm. to see museums and things, and it was great. And then you, you went from uh, Texas or Oklahoma and Texas to um, L.A. Yeah, I was uh, born in Oklahoma, but mostly I grew up in Texas. And mm -hmm. uh, when I graduated from uh, art school, I couldn't really get work. I worked as a janitor in an insurance building for a year. 
And then I worked as a color separator for a year, uh, or part of a year in Dallas, which was very helpful actually in the print business. Oh yeah. Adjusting color and color mixing. And I couldn't really get the work I was looking for, so I, went to, I had to decide between LA and New York, and I went to New York and it seemed scary and dirty and creepy. You just visited New York, you mean? I visited New York. Yeah. And uh, that's before the people had to pick up dog waste. Right, right. So it was slippery <laughs> back then. The subways were a lot different back then, too. It was yeah. really scary. And yeah. I, ha I have stories, but they're too long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, just so I went to L.A. It seemed like in, easier. In some ways, it was kind of easy in some ways. Was it? And it's maybe never easy to survive as an artist, but it was right. temperate. They had beautiful palm trees, nice people. People were slow like me. Uh huh. But that was the LA punk scene was happening. So you're talking about the now the 70s, right? I mean, in well, I moved to LA in '76, and in '77 I discovered uh, Slash magazine, and I was looking since uh, the early '70s for a place for my art t to fit in, and it mm -hmm. fit in graphically with punk. And mm -hmm. so I visited the guys at. Uh, at Slash, and they gave me a page, and so I began to get published. Sl was Slash a um, punk magazine? It was like yeah. punk rock. Was it a music punk magazine? Rock. It was a music magazine. Slash. And that was the first thing you ever did was uh, like a page for them. Yeah, I had, I started getting commercial work because I had to live, and so that's I couldn't really make change or anything. I mm -hmm. don't know numbers. I don't I don't do numbers. Uh huh. <laughs> but. Uh, so anyway, I do drawings. And but was it mostly music-related stuff you were doing, or like uh, album art and stuff like that at that time? Anything I could get. A lot of yeah. was music, because there was a lot of uh, uh, record companies in Los Angeles and movie companies, so I could work on po movie posters and so on, mm -hmm. and uh, just whatever, whatever it took to pay the rent. And my work was always strange, so it never really fit into the art world easily. Uh, Did you start publishing comics back then? or? I started publishing, uh, self-publishing comics, which became a whole a phenomenon, really. Now they call them zines, right? Zines, like, <laughs> mini comics, yeah. self-published comics, alt comics. But uh, there weren't many people doing it back then. Linda Berry and Matt Groening and mm -hmm. our friend Byron Werner and myself were probably the only people practically in L.A. doing that sort of thing. Is that when Matt Groening was doing uh, Life in Hell? Life in Hell. And the two bunny rabbits who were... Yeah, I met Matt, and uh, he was working at a copy shop, so he could make really elaborate comics at night. I guess after the shop was closed, and he made like oh, yeah? really fat uh, Xerox comics with foldouts and right paper. He cover wasn't doing chain. The Simpsons then. He was doing it no, was like it was these it weird was years bunny rabbit before. things. Yeah, he was broke then. Yeah. But he had more money than me because I noticed when I went to his place there was change lying on the floor. Change on the floor? He wore shorts. <laughs> and he would lie on the floor and the change would fall out of his shorts. Uh huh. Uh, Bermuda shorts. Oh, good. This and is a lot of insight. So if we got hungry, we could walk around <laughs> and look for quarters in his carpet. Right. Did you start doing Jimbo then? Or? I did about the same time, in about 77, I guess, is when he was first published. You did uh, Jimbo in L.A., or you started doing that in L.A.? I started drawing it in Texas in, a, in about 74 for myself, mm -hmm. but again, it didn't fit anywhere. It didn't fit with hippie comics. Yeah. Arcade, magazine, Arcade magazine existed then, but I didn't send it to Arcade because it was a little stranger than hippie comics even. And so I kind of had to wait for some place that would fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it was, uh, I mean, your style with Jimbo has really changed. I mean, right. all, lots of different Jimbos I've noticed are done in these different styles. And right. you have a very, <clears throat> the, were the early ones um, like the more simple ones? And then they got very complicated, I know, at, later. They were but. very scratchy in the beginning. I had a line that was almost sewn uh, like this. Yeah, yeah. Because I, that's... my rapidographs were jamming. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just trying to, I'm left-handed, uh -huh. so I just had trouble getting my tools to work. Mm -hmm. So that kind of like, and I liked woodcuts, so when I was having problem with my art materials, but it looked like woodcuts, then I was like, okay. I'll yeah, because some of your work has that kind of bold woodcut look to it, but that, to, it's not woodcuts, though. Or? It's not wood, sometimes it is, but mostly it's just drawn with ink on paper, mostly. Yeah. And over years, I found more, uh, 
tools to help. Like now there's great uh, Japanese nibs. It's like, you know, antique. Oh, you yeah, dip yeah. it in the ink. No, rapidographs are a constant right. problem, it seems right. like. They just, they're always jamming. They have a great feel, but they're a problem. Are you a, a believer in like the old crow quill pen, the steel tip crow quill pen, the kind that you dip in a bottle right. of ink? Or? That's what I use now. Yeah. But actually, uh, the Japanese started making them for cartooning and the steel was better and they're pointier, so actually my antique tools are more adv advanced now than when I first started oh, yeah? drawing. Yeah. The steel got better. And uh, who is Jimbo? Jimbo, right. I guess he's an alternate. He's is like he a, you an or is it? Ego. He's, a, he's kind of a pug nose, red haired, freckle faced, um, all American guy in a way. Right. But he goes he looks around. like Archie a little bit, or <laughs> I don't know. It's like Archie meets uh, Joe Palooka meets my brother, and you know, yeah. So uh, he's just got. Then he wears a kilt. <laughs> big dumb guy wearing a kilt and not much else. Uh huh. He just walks around trying to get breakfast in a world gone mad. Trying to get breakfast. Why, why the kilt? That's. I think in in Cub Scouts they once made us wear. Uh, kilts, you know, and dance around a fire, Is that right? which was a light bulb with cellophane. That sounds wrong. Somehow. And you're like in front of everyone, but basically naked with a little strip of cloth. Really? There was something that stuck with me about that. Uh-huh. I'm part like, Native American. I'm part Choctaw okay. Indian. So I think oh, so it goes, that's part of it too. Right. And are you part Scottish? Or? Perhaps. And I, some... Panter, who knows? It's English. It means the pantry, the guy that keeps the pantry. Is that right? Yeah, the pantler. It was the pantler and it became panter. Uh-huh. But the family story in my family is that we're Jewish. Is that right? Yeah, a lot of people move to America and become hillbillies and have to, and forget who they are. And uh, so that's our family story is that we were Jewish. In, in, your, in the European sense or in the It's the only, th it's just one sentence. It's, there's not any story that goes along what we is think that right? we might be Jewish. You know? <laughs> but uh, so what is uh, what is Dal Tokyo then? Dal Tokyo is the place where all my cartoons take place and it's a all uh, your not just Jimbo? Or? No, pretty much it all takes place in Dal Tokyo. It's and this alternate universe you've created for to all your characters to inhabit. Or? It came about uh, when I was working as a janitor actually. When I was working as a janitor, I started fantasizing about the desks being city blocks and uh, uh -huh. I invented a history for them. But it turned into uh, an idea about a colony on Mars uh, started by Texans and Japanese, hence Dal uh -huh. Tokyo, Dallas, Tokyo. Oh, Dallas, Tokyo, right. okay. And so that's I the never idea. Made that connection. That Mars has been terraformed and... Is that right? Yeah, that's, that was the idea. Uh -huh. I have a, a book coming out uh, called Dal Tokyo in the spring, which will detail that a little bit. The history of the prequel for all the, the Jimbo prequel. stories or something. What? Or like the creation of Dal Tokyo? Or? It's just about the place, but actually it's a surrealist book, I would say. It's a book that starts off with a story you could comprehend, and then the further you get into it, the more difficult and unfriendly it is. Uh -huh. And then it gets friendly again right at the last minute. Yeah, because you're not big on real linear narratives. I mean, your narratives are generally kind of surreal narratives that happen here. Right? Yeah, I mean, sometimes, some are more than others. There's a book, Cola Madness, that has a straight narrative. And uh -huh. the cartoons I'm drawing these days have straight narratives, because I've done all kinds of experimental work. Right, because so. you're, because you have, uh, do you want to talk about your, um, the Jimbo in Purgatory? Purgatory. And, um, because uh, yeah. you're doing uh, Dante's Divine Comedy with Jimbo as Dante, and then Virgil is a, like a machine that he he's rides. He's a parole robot, actually. Okay. Jimbo got in a little trouble. Uh, right. Um, so he, me, rides, really... he rides this kind of robot around through uh, yeah. the it's, circles of hell? Everyone will have those eventually, <laughs> not in the near future. I hope future. so. But uh, I guess reading Dante was good for me as like a ex-fundamentalist Christian to mm -hmm. read like, you know, a pre-Renaissance or early Renaissance mind, this brilliant mind. And uh, Dante's take, as I understand it, was really interesting to me because it has to do with, uh, with love, 
love enhanced or thwarted or and so on rather than an angry adolescent god who will kill you mm -hmm. forever for you know breaking the rules well dante was getting a certain degree of revenge on the florentine bankers also by he putting was. them in compromising situations in hell and they didn't kill him <laughs> somehow because i right. think he made something useful for people to use actually so d does dal tokyo disappear in these or does it become uh, does it become hell and then purgatory or? it's recast in in mount purgatory in my comics it's a institution of higher learning uh -huh. it's a jimbo's trying to get a degree in english history in english literature but it's conducted in this robotic uh, mall mm -hmm. and so he has to scale this mountain and the mountain's a test in that for every place he re station on the mountain he reaches he has to quote something that suggests he knows that literary moment and From allude to some level. other piece of literature that echoes that moment. So it's really a reading list more than anything uh, because mm -hmm. I started reading, my, I'm badly educated, uh, not that the teachers didn't try, but I was not a good student. And so at the point when I was doing th those Jimbo adaptations of Dante. I was really reading every sort of classical satire I could get my hands on oh, yeah? and kind of recommending them, you know. So you refer to them throughout the text? And it's, a, it's, a, it's a book that's impossible to read and it's heavily footnoted, but there's no numbers on the footnotes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you just figure it out. <laughs> but you've created, it, you're diverging from, I mean, you, it's not like you're sticking with Dante's text, you're diverging Pretty much. From, I mean, it doesn't look the same, but all the, the places that people are the and the things they, they say are alluded to. And when I did Inferno, I was just kind of replacing the characters in Dante's Inferno with my characters that had similar attributes, if I could find them. Mm -hmm. And then Purgatory was a much more purgatorial process. It became a really very convoluted <clears throat> procedure because mm -hmm. I took made the premise, this is going to be really exciting, of... Uh, my premise, which is probably untrue, is that Boccaccio's Decameron is an encoded version, a reference to Dante's Divine Comedy. Mm -hmm. And so I looked for uh, similarities and I did word counts and... and s between the Decameron and... Between the Decameron and the Divine Comedy uh -huh. and looked for images that would allude to the themes and it was really crazy. Mm -hmm. Is it easy to... is it... Uh, you have to decode it then sort of as you're reading it or if you wanted to see that or do you make it obvious? It's to be decoded. There's one reviewer, I think his name was Adam White, who did an amazing version of actually getting all of the text Is that right? and working, kind of solving the puzzle, but I never expected anyone to try to do that in a way. I just hoped they would go read satires. So are you going to do Paradise? Or Maybe. You've done Purgatorio and Inferno. I've done Purgatory and Inferno, so... Yeah, I have to have to Are do you, a lot of research. Paradise seems like it would be a fun one. I mean. It's really, paradises would be take the form more of mandalas in a way. It's mm -hmm. almost like Buddhist sand paintings or something. There's all these concentric circles that on Dante's trip from mm -hmm. earthly paradise to the, you know, proximity to God. Yeah. Uh, they could be having these. barbecues and rock concerts and, you know. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, 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 but I don't know. I don't know. There'd be many ways to, to treat it, but I'd have to study it. I've actually, if I've applied for a grant to study for it, so if I got the grant, I'll yeah, have a year study. So we'll see. So have you have you done any other um, like classic literature? Uh, if I have, I've forgotten. Okay. <laughs> Usually, but I'm you just remember, making things up. You remember the comic, cla the classic comics. Um, Classics Illustrated. Yeah, I I can remember those from childhood where they. They did, or like Moby Dick or something in comic book right. form and stuff. Right. They, Moby, T Moby Dick in 32 pages. Were you thinking of that at all? When, or did you read those when you were a kid? Uh, I liked them. I was aware of them. I mean, I liked them. I liked some of them. Some of them were more readable than others. I wonder, did they, was there ever a Dante's Inferno, I wonder? It's like I imagine there was. I, I would be surprised if there weren't. I don't remember it offhand. I was real, str I was I, very struck by... Uh, Oh, uh, what's the one? H.G. Wells' um, War of the Worlds mm -hmm. that had a great cover, and mm -hmm. it was really kind of close to the story. As a classic comic, you mean? Yeah. yeah. But, uh, so was was Pee Wee Herman a fan of Jimbo's, or how, what? What? How did that 
uh, happen? I well, guess so. I, I think that at the point when I was contacted by Pee Wee and his people, uh, I was visible in LA because I'd done Frank Zappa covers, I'd done a lot of posters and things for punk screamer, bands. You did the Screamers. I did the Screamers logo and you know various punk, th I was visible at that moment somehow and so I was approached to do a poster for his stage show and I didn't really know about him so I went to see his show and I saw that a lot of the things he was working on were similar to things that, uh, that I was working on in Dallas before I left with some friends. And we had a performance art group Perform that's what you call it, right? Performance art uh -huh. band or whatever. And we did puppets and comedy and things in galleries oh, right? and museums in Dallas and and it was similar to Pee Wee. And Pee Wee was doing a stage show like that? Or? He was doing an infantile, you know, a throwback to you know, 50s television kids but shows. But not, not for kids, it was for more like an ironic thing for adults or something. Or That's right, it was it was aimed at an adult audience. So there wasn't particularly, it was more nostalgic than really risque or anything, but uh, mm -hmm. it was aimed at adults. And, uh, and he had some of the characters that ended up on his TV show too, or were there on his stage show? It's true. There like was Phil a, Hartman and those guys? Or? Phil Hartman didn't end up on the TV show, he ended up going to Saturday Night Live and yeah. uh, but other people were. Miss Avon was on the stage show, uh -huh. and uh, but it was a whole new thing. But there were a lot of the characters carried through. Yeah. There was the movie Cowboy first. Uh, Cowboy Curtis. Cowboy Curtis, right? Which was uh, Fishman. I mean uh, Lawrence Fishburne. Lawrence Fishburne, right? Yeah. Giant actor. And yeah. uh, so anyway, that was a kind of an organic thing that grew out of the stage show, and. Uh, but we did write a movie script first for a movie that didn't get made. Paul and I wrote a movie, the first Pee Wee's Big Adventure for Paramount. We had a development deal. Oh yeah? And then they rejected it, and so he and Phil Hartman wrote the first Pee Wee movie that was made, and then after but that. that was after the TV show, wasn't it? That was it? before the TV oh, show. Oh, was it? Oh, okay. And uh, so uh, the second movie was a circus movie, and that was made at the same time as the TV show, or when we were right, on break right. or whatever. It was, was it? an intense showbiz experience. What was your role in the, in the on the TV show? I was the head designer. Mm -hmm. um, the show in the first year was done in New York at a company called Broadcast Arts, and they're a very amazing company that did every kind of animation, and they had their whole staff. Mm -hmm. And uh, but then I came in as head designer, and I have two friends that were worked with me on the show as co-designers. Wayne White and Rick Heitzman. Rick, I'd right. gone to college with, and he was in the performance art group with me. And Jay Cotton, who was in the same performance art group, ended up writing the music for Pee Wee initially. And uh, they were, uh, and you were like a design team, or were, were there? Are there specific things that you can point to in the show that you were more responsible for, or less, or so? Um. A lot of the things you see on the show were designed by other people. I designed a lot of things. Uh, mm -hmm. What I actually did was orchestrate things a lot. And as head designer, if you're a head designer, you get to sit in more meetings. Mm -hmm. you know, so a lot of it was like reading scripts, finding out what there is to design, and then designing multiple versions of them. And then it was Paul's show, so he was involved in choosing the you know, what the final elements looked like. Yeah, because that everything had to be, there were all those characters like the chair and the floor and the globe and mm -hmm. uh, Randy. I mean, I always, thought, I always thought Randy seemed like Jimbo to me. Is that, am I wrong or is that? He, he's, he looked a little like Jimbo to me, but he was designed by Wayne White. Wayne oh, was he? Did, Wayne designed okay. all the puppets on the show. And, oh, yeah? uh, he was a puppeteer. He'd worked with Red Grooms before uh, he worked on the PV yeah, show. Yeah, it does have a Red Grooms feeling and, to it. And uh, he said it was a, a neighbor kid that he knew. Randy? Yeah, that's what he said. The bad kid, the bad little kid. But it was fine with me. I didn't really want Jimbo on the show, you know? <laughs> it was like, let it be the no, PV I show. No, not by, not by name. But it looks like know. him a bit. A little bit, yeah. Pug that, nose. Yeah, the kind of freckled face. But Randy's kid, evil. Jimbo's yeah, he is very evil. Jimbo's nice. Jimbo's just confused a little bit, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Boring, even. But um, so they would write all these scripts, like around all these characters, because all the characters had to be established, and then they'd write these scripts revolving around the characters, right? Yeah. Right. We would, before the season started and continuing, the, sh the scripts were being written. And so one mm -hmm. of my jobs was to read these scripts and notate anything visual. 
Uh -huh. oh, there's a talking window. There's a cow that comes uh -huh. to the talking window. Right, the talking there's a window. kitchen. You know, where are these things in relation to each other? And that's a lot of what I did. In the second season, we went to L.A. and the set got very big and different. Where and, were you? Uh, where did it begin? It began in New York. We did it on Broadway at, at uh, above Houston. Is and that I right? Found a sweatshop and threw all those sewing machines out and built this set there. It was uh -huh. tiny and intense, and it wasn't. Is that a, right? It wasn't a set. So there had to be an air conditioning truck on the street with a big tube that ran up into the building so everyone huh. didn't die in there. Oh, I always assumed it was always in California, I guess. After the uh, first year, it was and mm -hmm. for various companies. And then how many years did it go? Was I don't it? know. There were... It was intense. <laughs> it was just going to burn me out. Because uh, I was also working on all the toy design and product design at the same time. So I would oh, work right, for two right. months on the TV show, that, yeah. and then I would go work on products. Yeah, and then the whole thing kind of fell apart after. You did a while. some of that packaging of, of the toys and so forth. Yeah, yeah. with fifty companies, it, it was a uh, it was intense. Yeah, the marketing, yeah, the mer merchandising, merch, merch. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it then was fun. we made an incredible show. I think for kids, I think oh, kids it was, loved it. Yeah, but, it was but, but totally I got burned incredible. out. I just got. And you can't really talk after doing something. Really, like it was that. like a 24 hours. Right. You were t on. It's like being a John Waters movie a little bit, uh -huh. like designer frenzy or something. You know, yeah. people like run at you and show you swatches of cloth. Right. Like right. What sh what should cherry be? Uh huh. You know this or this or this or this or this <laughs> or this. Now you know. And, and then uh, that after that you went, came to New York or that you moved to New York in the 80s. I came uh, to New York right before the PB show happened. And so in 85 I came and the PB show I guess started in 86 or something like that. Uh-huh. And so you I mean was already before here. it started airing or but, right. Right. And then uh, But the first show in LA it was a outgrowth of the stage show. So yeah. that was out of the Groundling Theater and that became an HBO show. Mm -hmm. But the CBS television show was a couple of years later. Oh okay. Oh I see. And then uh so, but you know, you normally want to just be in your studio painting, right? I mean, yeah. that, that's Pee Wee's an intense thing, but right. you know, if you, um, if you had your choice, you'd probably just want to sit and be in your studio painting. Right? No, it's and, true, and that's mostly what I do, but mm -hmm. I have to make money, and so I worked as a commercial artist, like, however, you know, whatever the jobs were, you know, mm -hmm. I did a lot of all kinds of things as a yeah. commercial artist, but in a way, it's easier to get famous as a cartoonist and it's easier to get famous as yeah. a commercial artist than get known as a painter because mm -hmm. as a painter, you put your work in a gallery and 200 people come through in a month and have a look right. at it. And if you do illustrations for Rolling Stone or Time yeah, Magazine, a then a million see people it. see yeah. them. Well, thanks, Gary. Uh, that concludes our program. Um, please join us again for our next episode of Constructing Knowledge. <laughs>